appreciate your time. I know that you're all very busy, so it means a lot that you're able to make time to attend our No and Go Friday sessions. I think that they're always very, there's a lot to learn at them, and so I think it's, uh, I know it's worth my time, and I hope that you feel the same. My name is Holly Brenner. I think I know most of you, although I do see a few new faces, which is always nice to see every month, so please keep spreading the word. We'll start out with a reflection, and this one is very much in the spirit of Valentine's Day. It's called the Legend of St. Valen Valentine's. The legend says St. Valentine was in a prison cell, thinking of his little flock he had always loved so well. And wanting to assure them of his friendship and his love, he picked a bunch of violets and sent them by a dove. And on the violets' leaves, he, peer he pierced these lines divine that simply said, I love you, and I'm your valentine. So through the years that followed, from, the day onto the, from that day onto this, folks still send messages of love and seal them with a kiss. Because a saint in prison reached through his prison bars and picked a bunch of violets and sent them out to say that faith and love can triumph no matter where you are, for faith and love are greater than the strongest prison bar. So, get us in the season. I wore red today, a little bit of red. I see a few red shirts out there. Not a lot of holiday spirit, though. <laughs> Anyway, we have a few housekeeping things. We do have folks with us, <coughs> Griffin and, and in Wuhan. Karen, thanks for helping out in Griffin today. Appreciate that, pinch hitting for us. On your tables in front of you, we have information on our next No and Go Friday session, which is Friday, March 13th. Please take a look at this one. We have Steve Little, who's of course our president and CEO, and Dr. Mike, Mike DeGear presenting. And Dr. DeGear is our vice president of population health. And we'll be learning more about our accountable care organization the ACO that I'm sure that you've heard the, um, something about, but they'll be filling in some holes for us. We have the yellow sheet in front of you too, which is a comment card. I tell you every month that I appreciate your feedback and I sincerely do, so please keep that information coming. We build the programming around what your comments are, and we even adjust the heat based on what you tell us. <laughs> and the uh, green door prize, if you're interested in, in the chance to win a door prize today, please fill that out, and also if you're interested in receiving credit for being here. And I also want to just put a, one more plug in your ear. We care about your health very much. And as you've noticed, when you came down the hall, I'm sure you saw all of the white shields over here, the biometrics, the HRA. If you haven't signed up and taken care of that, please do that. It's very important. We care about your health, and it's important that you get that taken care of. So with that, I will introduce our presenters for today. We have Dr. Coleman here with us. Dr. Coleman is a perinatologist who comes to us from Frater the Medical College of Wisconsin, where he is the director of the section of internal fetal medicine. He's also a professor of obstetrics and gynecology, cellular biology, neurobiology, and anatomy. <laughs> That's a lot to even say. We're fortunate to have him with us on Fridays. He's here all day on Fridays at Asian Healthcare. He's fellowship trained in maternal fetal medicine from Eastern Virginia School of Medicine. Is also board certified in maternal fetal medicine, and obstetrics, and gynecology. We're also fortunate to have with us Carolyn Terry today. Carolyn is a neonatal nurse, neonatal nurse practitioner with 35 years of experience, and she's relatively new here at Evasion, but I think has brought a wealth of knowledge and experience to our team. She is certified in neonatal and pediatric transport. So with that, Dr. Coleman. Okay, can everybody hear me? What I'd like to do is kind of tell you what we're doing out there. Um, our group uh, covers pretty much of, uh, we're covering the Fox River Valley, we're also in Appleton, uh, here every Friday, and we're planning on expanding, hopefully up here in the Fox River Valley eventually. But I think things are going extremely well. And uh, what I'd like to start out with, by telling you what uh, our team consists of, and the team consists of uh, OBGYN nursing and reception staff, obviously. Our two uh, MAs, Amy and Belinda. Obviously the OBGYN providers from up here and also the family medicine providers. Um, very crucial part of our team are the sonographers. Uh, the big thing is that they've combined 150 years of sonographic experience, they're outstanding. <coughs> and these would be Renee, Lil, Jess, Jean, and Paula. They're all registered by the American Registry of Diagnostic Medical Sonographers in Obstetrics and Gynecology. And uh, another important certification they have 
<coughs> is to evaluate first trimester embryos, <coughs> excuse me, up to about 13 and 6 7 weeks by measuring the thickening of the back of the neck, which is associated with an increased risk for chromosomal abnormalities and uh, structural abnormalities, mainly that of the heart and also uh, single gene abnormalities such as congenital diaphragmatic hernias. Now, what is maternal fetal medicine? We're also called perinatologists. Uh, we're a subspecialty of OBGYN, which means that we did back when I did it, which was a few years ago, um, it was a two-year fellowship and now it's a three-year <coughs> fellowship and it emphasizes pretty much getting more clinical uh, finesse as far as obstetrics go, genetics and uh, prenatal diagnosis either with ultrasound and the genetic modalities that we have. And also uh, we spend a lot of time in the lab, okay? But uh, basically I can't emphasize the most important thing that, that it's a team approach and a team up here has been extremely, extremely good. So what defines a high-risk pregnancy? Pretty much anything, all the various classes of diabetes including uh, gestational diabetes, uh, we're seeing an increased number of multiple births because of the uh, reproductive uh, technologies that are out there. Uh, one of the areas that I'm particularly interested in and I've got a very large uh, clinic at uh, Waukesha Freighter and we're starting to see more patients here are those patients with clotting disorders and also those patients with bleeding disorders. The most common uh, thing that we see is advanced maternal age. I know that sounds terrible, it's just something, ACOG needs to change that. I think it should be more mature, but unfortunately, <laughs> it's an advanced maternal age. Uh, we see a lot of abnormal pregnancy testing, uh, screening. They come in, we make sure their dates are correct, and if it is an abnormal screen, they get subsequent counseling and offer genetic testing. Um, if there's a family history of birth defects or genetic conditions, uh, most of them are pretty common we can handle, but oftentimes we need to get genetic counseling involved or our actual geneticist down at the uh, uh, Freighter and uh, Children's Hospital. And we'll review a case like that in just a little bit. If the patients had previous pregnancy complications, the recurrence risk is increased, okay? Just like having a cold. You have a cold one year, you're going to get a cold the next year. Uh, if they have previous pregnancy complications, such as preterm labor, um, or particularly pregnancy-induced hypertension, uh, the recurrence risk is like 15 to 30 percent in subsequent pregnancies. And that depends on what type of uh, hypertension it is. Um, most common ones that we see are uh, uh, basically uh, elevated blood pressure and then any other additional medical complications. We see a lot of bariatric patients that have had uh, uh, banding and what have you. Uh, they're at significant risk even if they lose 100 to 120 pounds. Uh, they have significant problems with absorption. Uh, there's an increased risk for stillbirth in the obese patients, so uh, we also see quite a few of those. <clears throat> so what services do we provide here? Uh, <clears throat> Preconception counseling is probably paramount. If we can see them before they get pregnant, kind of prepare them for what to expect. It's always better than getting pregnant and saying, oh, I didn't know that. Uh, genetic consultation, uh, we do genetic testing, we do amniocentesis. Uh, if we do chorionic villa sampling, I can make those arrangements in Appleton or you can come down to Freighter. I don't do those. Uh, but we do amniocentesis and then we have the cell-free fetal DNA uh, where we're capable of actually getting cell-free fetal DNA from the maternal circulation and screening them for three chromosomal abnormalities. <coughs> and that's expanding and there are other things they're looking at as well, but uh, as far as screening tests, it's the best screening test that we have. But we have to be careful because we're only supposed to offer those to patients with risk factors such as advanced maternal age or an ab abnormal nuchal translucency. So we have to be careful. Um, this area is taken off considerably. If we have to do an invasive procedure such as pubs where we actually sample the fetal blood from the umbilical cord or have to do a transfusion, uh, we have to do those down at the Freighter and Children's Hospital. Um, we do a lot of di oh, geez. we do a lot of diagnostic studies uh, for growth studies. We do biophysical uh, ultrasounds to make sure the baby's doing well. It's an in utero neurological exam, if you will. And we also do anatomic surveys, and we also do fetal echocardiograms. Um, if we see an abnormality um, and those particular patients need counseling, we immediately plug them into our fetal concern center in Wisconsin. They're contacted by one of the nurses and. We have physicians from Children's Hospital 
they come up to Appleton. I think some of them uh, come around here. Uh, for instance, if we identify a urological exam, Dr. Durkee comes up here and he can talk to these patients without having to drive to Milwaukee. <coughs> so uh, this is a very important service that we have. It's very unique, okay? Uh, multiple gestations, uh, previous maternal complications, and we're seeing a lot of substance abuse. We're having seen a lot of patients on Subutex and methadone. And uh, one of my partners, Cresta Jones, is that's her expertise, and uh, she's involved at the state level and also the uh, uh, regional level as far as dealing with these patients and establishing programs. Um, why is it a benefit to the community? Uh, first of all, they're able to stay here, okay? And we do everything we can to keep the patients on campus. Um, we identify those multiple births that can be delivered here at Ignatian. They don't have to go to Freighter unless it's uh, a unique case or if I request a second opinion with one of my partners. And I strongly emphasize that in our group. Um, <clears throat> most of the genetic testing, such as amnio and that sort of thing, can be sent out. Um, we're centrally located. Okay, and what's really unique is that I'm in the department where the OBGYN providers are. So um, they help me, I help them, uh, and we also, I might be able to get more information than what I'm able to see but not a chart. So that's all very good. Am I doing that? I think because you're looking again and you're fine. Okay. Um, I'm here every Friday. Sometimes I'm here Thursdays. Um, ultimately, we might be rotating so you get to see new faces and uh, younger faces, that is. And uh, <laughs> we're available to the patients and providers at all time. We've got a call center, you can call after hours, and we're, like I said, available all the time. What I'd like to do is start out by reviewing some interesting cases that we had up here. Uh, the first case was a, a lady who showed up, uh, I can't remember if it was about Pond and Rippin, I want to say Rippin, um, but uh, got referred for fetal ascites. Just to get you oriented, this is a cross section through the abdomen. Here's the liver, here's the stomach, here's the spleen, and then you can see this darkened area here, which is, man, my fingers are big. Um, this darkened area, which is fluid. So when you see this, uh, it's only one space, because if you see in another space, it's referred to as high drops, and that confers a bad prognosis. But this is just confined to the abdomen. So we go through a list of ABCs, one, two, threes, whatever, and what we need to do is rule out a chromosomal abnormality, a structural abnormality. Uh, we have to think of fetal infectious disease such as cytomegalovirus, toxoplasmosis, and that sort of thing. So uh, there's also some other genetic testing that was a little bit more involved. So I, we sent her down to Freighter, and uh, uh, we ruled out everything by doing an amniocentesis. There was some special genetic testing that had to be done. So. So that's, that's not you, that's our system. Oh, is it? Is there another mic on by any chance, Colleen? Um, she has the other yours is off, right? <laughs> Mine's off. Yeah, yours is off. Yeah, mine's off. Right. Yeah, the green light's not on. So anyway, uh, we continue to follow for growth, and uh, one of the things that we can do now is using an ultrasound technique called Doppler, and we can determine if the baby's anemic or not. Many times we used to have to sample the umbilical cord, but when we were dealing with RH disease, we had to do serial amniocentesis to assess the degree of hemolysis. Um, and what we did, we did serial MCA Dopplers, middle cerebral artery Dopplers, and the baby was never anemic. Um, because this is a very uh, rare scenario, uh, she delivered at uh, Freighter, and uh, ultimately the baby did fine and went home, uh, I think, day three, day four of life. And they were just going to follow the baby with uh, Serial ultrasounds. So it was a very interesting case. We do ultrasound for the baby. I'm sorry? You said serial ultrasounds for the mother or the baby? The baby. With the increase in the assisted reproductive technologies, we're seeing a lot of uh, this. This is a triplet gestation that we were following up here. One of the key things is to uh, make sure that they uh, have their separate placentas. Uh, this fortuitously is a trichorionic. Here's a placenta for this one, and then a placenta here for this one, and another placenta over here, and they tend to fuse. And what we want to do is see this nice little membrane here. Uh, when it's really uh, thin, or if we don't see, this is not the best example, if we don't see 
uh, an evagination of the placental tissue into it. Then we're concerned about monochorionic pregnancies. And it's not uncommon if they put two embryos in, uh, one splits, hopefully it splits early, so you end up with two placentas, but the later they split, they end up sharing a placenta. And what you can have then is conjoined twins on a placenta called twin-to-twin -twin uh, with the vessels and you can de develop twin-to-twin uh, -twin transfusion syndrome. The other uh, uniqueness to multiple gestations is that they've increased risk for congenital anomalies and also an increased risk for, <coughs> for uh, chromosomal abnormalities. I'll give you an example, a 32-year-old with uh, twins or triplets have the same risk of a 35-year-old for Down syndrome with one and that's basically one in 270. So they get counseled accordingly. We do the fetal anatomic surveys. The multiple gestations are also at increased risk for growth disturbances, most commonly fetal growth restriction, and significant discordancy, which increases the risk for intrauterine and fetal death. So we do serial scanning on these, and we also do fetal testing. Generally, with multiples, we'll start them as early as uh, 28 to 30 weeks. <coughs> you heard us uh, mention Earlier, um, heard me mention earlier as far as measuring the nuchal fold, just to get you uh, oriented here. Here's the face, so the fetus is looking down here. Here's the neck, here's the back of the neck, and here's the back, here's the chest, and then the rest of the fetus is out of the, out of the plane. So this was a twin gestation. Uh, twin, a, twin A had an abnormal nuchal translucency, okay? Twin B had a normal nuchal translucency. We defined that under three millimeters, and this was uh, 3.9 millimeters. So the patient was counseled, um, and I really apologize. No, it's not you, it's yeah. us, we apologize. Um, as far as the, uh, we talked to her about genetic testing, they didn't want to undergo invasive genetic testing, so we sent off a cell-free fetal DNA, which uh, can come back usually within seven to ten working days and the false positive rate is roughly one percent and the reason it's one percent is the attorneys for the company told them to move the decimal point on the other side of the one so it's an excellent screening test okay um, so it came back positive for trisomy 21 and so we were we were following this pregnancy pretty thoroughly and then later on in pregnancy during the we actually saw it earlier in about 14 to 15 weeks but the baby had a characteristic heart defect associated with Down syndrome called an AV canal. Uh, she went on and uh, she delivered, uh, and twin A did have Down syndrome, had an AV canal. Uh, they're doing fine, and just waiting for this uh, baby to grow large enough to have its heart fixed. Not all babies with AV canals need to have their hearts fixed immediately, okay? Now, one of the things that I kind of... Do you want to switch over with this one instead? Would that be easier so it's not... Otherwise, you probably could get away without one if you want to project. Sorry, I project well. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Sorry about that. It's on. Uh, one of the albatrosses around my neck, other than some, like a choroid plexus cyst, which we won't go into, <coughs> or a little bright spot in the heart, one of the hardest things to is uh, echogenic bowel in the fetus. So this is the cross section, here's the chest. And it's really more of a coronal, but basically here's the chest, here's the heart, along with lungs, here's a part of the diaphragm, and this is, this is bowel, notice how bright the bowel is. So once again, we do our ABCs, our one, twos, and threes, and when we see this, we ask if mom's had some bleeding early on in pregnancy, because then the baby can swallow the blood, and this is what it can look like. Um, we ask about any infectious uh, diseases which we can screen for, such as cytomegalovirus, toxo, and uh, herpes virus. And then are we dealing with uh, uh, potential for an evolving bowel obstruction, okay? And then the other thing we have to consider, and this is something we always forget, is offering mom screening for cystic fibrosis. Um, she declined uh, invasive testing, so we did serological screening and cell-free fetal DNA. Cell-free fetal DNA was fine, the serology was negative, we continued to follow, and ultimately uh, this uh, uh, child did well, delivered at 40 weeks here at uh, St. Agnes. <coughs> Let's see. Now this is an example, this is something that we see pretty, pretty commonly. Um, this is a 22-year-old, and this was at 13 weeks gestation. Just to get you oriented again, this is the fetal head, okay? This is the back of the fetus, 
okay? And what you can see, as opposed to a nuchal translucency, is this is a cystic hygroma, okay? And what happens is sometimes, you know, they've got arteries developing, veins developing. Once the arteries are done, then the lymphatic system develops. So you have lymph nodes, and they have to be connected to each other by lymph vessels. And they all drain into this common area in the chest, where if you get obstruction, you get the backup of lymph, okay? And it's pretty, pretty significant. And when you see a cystic hygroma, there's a very, very, very increased risk for uh, chromosomal abnormalities and also an increased risk for uh, other structural abnormalities. The well, main one would be that of the heart. Um, she was subsequently counseled. Uh, she did not want to have chorionic villus sampling. Uh, the risk for chorionic villus sampling is a 1 in 180 as far as loss. She wanted to wait for an amniocentesis, which was uh, a risk of 1 in 200 to 1 in 300. She felt better with that. And then she showed up for her amniocentesis and there were no cardiac activity. Okay, so we had a fetal demise, which is not, also not uncommon when you see cystic hygromas. But there's, that would have not been anything different if you had a, tested her at, uh, previously with a one in eight uh, chance of risk. It would have, the, the result would have been the same, correct? I mean, there was no way to prevent Well, the one in 180 is loss from the right. procedure. So if she had a risk of one in 180, that's kind of a wash. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. When you see this, when you see something like this, it probably kicks your risk up to about 1 in 50, if not higher. Uh, this is an interesting case. I'm very, very interested in the placenta. Uh, generally, it's normal to have one placenta, but occasionally you end up with two. So this is a cut through the uterus, and here's the front wall of the uterus. This is the back wall of the uterus. You see placental tissue here and placental tissue here. And what we have is, a, is the umbilical cord, usually attaches to the placenta, but in, but in this case, it uh, attaches to the amnion, and then it sends a branch up to this placenta, and it sends a branch down to this placenta. Man. And uh, this is called a bipartite placenta with a chorionic bridge, and that would be the chorionic bridge, basically, of the blood vessels going to the upper part and the lower part. And so th there's an increased risk for fetal growth restriction in placentation like this, so we followed for growth. And then the next important thing is that when the provider does the delivery, they make sure that they get all the placenta out, okay? But uh, we followed her for growth, and uh, she did fine. Um, the slide over here is kind of a precursor for the next slide. Uh, you can actually visualize kidneys, but you have to be careful because at some gestational age, if you see a renal form structure where the kidney can be, you might be looking at a big adrenal gland, okay? And so what we do is we make sure that we throw blood flow. This is Doppler blood flow going to the kidney here and going to the kidney here. Now, in this particular case, um, you see something over here, but actually that's the adrenal gland. And then when you put the blood flow on, we have a normal kidney over here with the renal artery. And so what we have here is unilateral renal agenesis, okay? Now, I can't remember if this is a female or a male, but in a female, if you have uh, congenital absence of one of the kidneys or if you have any kidney abnormality, most, usually most commonly agenesis or duplication on one side, there's a 20% chance that the fetus is going to have a uterine anomaly, something that we can't diagnose now, but we prepare the patients accordingly. Uh, you can live with one kidney. Obviously, you've got to be careful with contact sports. They've got a bunch of mechanisms out that are... Uh, covering the various areas during contact sports, so uh, things have gotten a lot better as far as uh, quality of life for these kids. But they generally do vibe, they survive. Um, unfortunately, just have one kidney. Oh, about three weeks ago, we got a patient uh, with a diagnosis of severe fetal growth restriction, okay? And so we did the ultrasound, and basically at roughly 30, I think 35, 36 weeks gestation, uh, we measured all the long bones, and look what they were measuring at, 25 weeks and 26 weeks. So uh, the bottom line here is I counsel the patient um, that most likely this is a skeletal dysplasia, and the list of skeletal dysplasias are quite long. But the key is, is what we need to do is determine if the chest is of normal size, because if the chest is small, the chances are this is a lethal congenital anomaly, okay? So besides pulling the rug out from underneath her, uh, the patient's father was in the room, 
and the patient's father informs me that the father of this baby is kind of a weird looking dude, okay? <laughs> so he's got these short, short humor eye, normal arms, short femurs, and normal tibia and fibula. So after laughing and specifically getting what he meant by that, the light kind of went on. And so the next thing that we had to do is take a look at the fetal face. And as you can see here, here's the fetal face. This is the profile. Uh, with general, the most common one is achondroplasia, you know, the little people that you see. Um, and generally with them, you see significant funnel bossing, okay? Uh, and uh, there is definitely a chin here. There was no evidence of microignathia or a small chin. But what I had difficulty is, is actually looking at the chest. So uh, what I did that day is we called fetal concerns and the plan was to arrange a CT scan down at Children's, which is capable of not only looking at the bones themselves, but the actual ossification centers. And they can tell me and tell us what type of uh, dysplasia we're dealing with, because there's some really weird ones out there. I couldn't get a decent view of the chest. Uh, the best I was able to get was uh, about a week and a half, two weeks later. She couldn't make it to freighter, so she showed up upstairs. And when I looked at the chest circumference, the best one I could get was under the 2.5 percentile. Um, but it's an unknown because it's not a good cut. When I compare this to the abdominal circumference, uh, we're at about 5 percent, below less than 0.5 percent. So uh, basically, uh, we had a little bit of a problem. And so uh, she was seen by her OB that day. And then she came back and, oh, by the way, she's contracting and she's three to four centimeters. So our plan was to send her to freighter. So we started magnesium sulfate for her transfer, got her down there. She presented, she continued to contract, changed her cervix, and she underwent a C-section. Uh, baby's apgars were reasonable, six and nine, but at about uh, an hour of life, the baby respiratory system kind of went down. So they intubated it. And uh, from what I could see and what I've been talking about with the genetics people is that this is not achondroplasia. It's probably, it's probably lethal, okay? And they're calling it uh, Jayun or what they call thoracic asphyxiating dysplasia. Um, so most likely this baby's not going to survive once it gets extubated. So the bad news is that it's recessive. So anytime she and this individual or, or significant other have a child, there's a 25% chance for this to recur, okay? So we got a lot of information, uh, but uh, this would have been a, uh, a real problem if we hadn't checked her and she went into labor. Uh, so unfortunately we get these bad cases, but uh, we were able to figure things out. Thank you. test this microphone. How's this one working? Good. Better? Okay. So thank you for coming. Um, as she mentioned, I'm Carolyn Terry. I'm a neonatal nurse practitioner and I'm very excited to be here as part of the Women and Infants Department at, at Ignatian Healthcare. Um, and uh, we'll be talking a bit, as, she, as he talked about the high-risk maternity care, whenever we're caring for a pregnant woman, actually we're caring for two patients. And the neonatal care services come into, come into play once that baby is born and may require some advanced care. Currently at Ignatian, we have two levels of neonatal care services available. We have a level one nurseries available at uh, Ripon Medical Center and Wampan Pond Memorial Hospital. And here at St. Agnes, we have a level two special care nursery. Um, these levels of care have been defined um, by the American Academy of Pediatrics and supported by a variety of <coughs> care organizations. Um, currently, the level one nurseries are capable of resuscitating and have been um, educated and certified in resuscitating and neonatal resuscitation protocols any baby that is delivered in their hospital. Um, they care for healthy term newborns primarily or very stable late preterm infants that are born between 34 and 37 weeks gestation. And um, 
They've also been certified, and everyone across the organization that cares for um, newborns and, and pregnant women have been certified in, an, in a program that uh, has evidence-based uh, practice guidelines for stabilizing infants prior to transport to a tertiary center or a higher level of care. Um, in a level one setting, the providers include pediatricians, family medicine practitioners, um, the pediatric nurse practitioners there, lactation consultants, and also the specially um, prepared nursing staff. The level two nursery that we have at St. Agnes has the same level one capabilities, plus in addition, we provide care routinely to 34 weeks um, infants that are born at or above 34 <coughs> weeks gestation, at or above 1,500 grams, which is about three, three and a half pounds. Um, those babies that are moderately ill, that have issues that are likely to be resolved relatively quickly um, over a two or three day course generally, and are not expected to need subspecialty care such as uh, peds cardiology, um, peds cardiology, pulmonary, um, and a variety of other services that would be available at a level three and four center. Um, we can also uh, provide care to infants that are convalescing from a NICU setting um, if, they re if they're from the area and, and they need to recover, uh, we can do that as well. Um, we do provide mechanical ventilation in the forms of nasal cannula support and, C and continuous positive airway pressure or CPAP for newborns. Um, and we also stabilize infants that are born in our facility at any gestational age based on our, our training and our protocols and um, stabilize them in, in waiting for the transport team to arrive. Um, we have had babies born here at 25 weeks gestation. Um, it generally takes about um, an hour or so for the transport team to arrive and in the meantime we have, we stabilize them the providers in the level two setting include pediatricians, the neonatal nurse practitioner, um, family practice physicians as well, lactation consultants, we have the, the nursing staff that's been trained here, care coordinator, spiritual care is involved. Um, we have radiologists we work with closely in assisting us with any kind of x-ray interpretation. And then we always have available the neonatology on consult uh, from the level three and four centers that we refer to. So in general, um, babies that require special care nursing services, uh, for the most part, immediately after birth are those that have respiratory distress from one, uh, in one form or another. Um, we may see babies that are full term that have some type of uh, transient tachypnea of the newborn, which is kind of retained lung fluid. That can generally resolve within the first day or two days of life and require some mild respiratory support. Um, these babies require continuous uh, monitoring, and we'll see some pictures of that in, the, in just upcoming slides. Uh, we can have late preterm infants that actually have respiratory distress syndrome, which is a surfactant deficiency, and that may take a bit longer to resolve, and we can provide them the support they need, and if the support that we can provide um, isn't quite meeting their needs, then we prepare them for transport. We have babies that might have cardiovascular disorders that we can maintain or stabilize depending on the circumstances. Um, neurologic disorders, and this also includes the babies that are experiencing neonatal abstinence syndrome. Um, we work very closely with the behavioral health department and managing that care that the mothers that are seeking treatment for opiate addiction um, and their babies that require the care and, and monitoring afterward might require. Um, and they may be the babies that we see in the nursery that stay here the longest. So we do build quite a um, relationship with the family uh, during their hospital stay. Uh, babies with GI, just throughout the whole, um, the whole possibility of disorders that we might see. Uh, neonatal sepsis, so these are babies that we might need to keep here for screening or for treatment for sepsis. That might require IV access for many days um, as well as antibiotic therapy. So here's a picture of a baby that required some mild respiratory support. Um, we have scaled down versions of, of equipment that you're probably familiar with, and this is a baby that's on a nasal cannula. 
Um, this is actually a baby that was up there. We have uh, great parents who graciously consented to have their babies photographed for this presentation. So this is a baby, a full-term baby, that requires <coughs> CPAP um, for respiratory distress at just after birth. I think this baby required the CPAP only for about 12 hours, and it was progressively weaned along with the oxygen requirement to maintain their oxygen saturations. Um, you'll see the baby has, um, it's an extensive amount of equipment for such a small patient, but it really does seem to help them. So this is our CPAP setup. Baby also has an IV in place. And this baby, just um, after this photograph was taken, was successfully transitioned off of CPAP entirely. So this is the, uh, the result, and this is what we're always hoping for. She was very happy to have that thing taken off of her face. Um, but I guess another point is the amount of training and the amount of expertise that these nurses have that take care of these babies. Um, you can see the amount of equipment it takes and the amount of technology. Um, we have babies that are cardiopulmonary monitored as well as pulse oximetry. Um, at the same time having IV therapies to maintain their blood glucose levels as well as give IV medications. Um, they're on a external uh, warming device, the radiant warmer, they, they aren't able to really maintain their own body temperature effectively when they're ill, so we have that to monitor and provide. They require accurate intake and output measurements, we weigh their diapers, it's just uh, a lot of direct nursing care concentration that's very fulfilling. Um, and you can see she looks very comfortable. <laughs> This is one of our preterm babies that we had here and we're able to keep. This baby was just 34 weeks gestation. You might see some differences between the previous baby. Who <laughs> was very pretty, I think she was L LGA or large for gestational age. So she had other issues as far as blood glucose. She tended to have a lower blood sugar. So she had other issues that were, you know, size doesn't always mean health in many cases <laughs> with babies, so we had other issues to deal with that were consistent with her um, history. So this little guy, um, it was a 34-weeker, and a little bit smaller, certainly, a little more immature. I kind of look at him and I see things like, um, you know, his skin is a little bit less mature, and he's just very drowsy, and, and a little, um, uh, less capable of being alert and attentive and, and in engaging his environment. I think we've all seen these thermometers, so this is kind of to put things into scale, um, how this, the size of this infant. I think this baby was just about 1,800 grams. Again, you can just see we, uh, the environment. We also try to have an attention to the developmental and neurodevelopmental care for these babies. Um, when you think about it, when babies are born prematurely, um, they are intended to really be exposed to all of the noise and temperature variance and light and everything that's in their environment. So we try to minimize those kinds of stimuli that aren't necessary. Um, this baby, you can see the environment is um, is kind of active, so we try to minimize that. Providing them boundaries and comfort in the form of, of boundaries and different developmental supportive equipment that we have is very important for their healing. And to minimize oxygen consumption and energy expenditure during their, uh, their convalescence. So providing simply the best neonatal care at Agnesian I, um, we're, we're holding true to the AAP um, statement from 2011 that, that indicates all institutions providing perinatal care must have personnel uh, trained to resuscitate and stabilize infants. And we've met that, um, that goal. Um, every baby, every, every, excuse me, every nurse, every respiratory therapist, uh, the physicians, and everyone that takes care of these newborns have been certified in the neonatal resuscitate, resuscitation program, which is an AAP, AHA um, guidelines for, um, for doing that and having a, um, a consistent way of approaching that with good outcomes. Um, those providers, there, we have a both hospital-based and regional trainers in this um, program available. And uh, that's across the board at all three facilities. 
And I think it's important to remember that um, patients that are coming into the emergency room, potentially in preterm labor, maybe visiting from somewhere else, are not familiar that they always think that any hospital provides the same level of care. So regardless of whether you have a level one nursery, level two nursery, or three or four, we are all um, need to be able to resuscitate an infant effectively and, all, and, be, and be able to stabilize them. There's the concept of the golden hour when it comes to neonatal resuscitation and stabilization that we need to hold to. Um, that first hour of life is very important to the long-term um, survival, morbidity, mortality rates, and neurodevelopmental outcomes for these babies. The STABLE program is another initiative that we have um, certified all, all providers across all three organizations in 2014 have been certified in STABLE. It's a mnemonic um, identifying the six different areas that a baby who's being stabilized prior to transport needs to be, um, we need to attend to. Sugar, temperature, airway, blood, uh, blood pressure, lab work, and emotional support for the family. And uh, it, it, it re requires some rather extensive training. It's a full eight hour training session and in addition to simulation based <coughs> skills, um, skills training. So, thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask if anyone had any questions about the services we provide, <coughs> either for Dr. Kuhlman or myself. Yeah? Um, I don't have a question, but I just wanted to just share with you guys that these two individuals have completely heightened our ability to care for our patients. So, we're very fortunate to have you guys working with us, and I think the changes that you've brought about in us as physicians and in our staff members has really brought a huge Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So, Dr. Coleman, what, what do the stats say as it relates to the number of babies? And I, this is a really broad question. So, let's let's refine it maybe to Wisconsin that you're seeing that have complications of pre-birth. In other words, that are having all. It, it, it seems like there's more today than there were maybe ten. Well, I think mater far, there are probably more maternal complications now yeah. in fetal, but uh, when you look at the incidence of uh, birth defects, it's about, uh, I would say, it hasn't changed much, 3 to 5%, probably closer to 3 But we're seeing more advanced maternal age, we're seeing sicker patients. Um, while we delay, there's an increased risk for hypertension, diabetes, that sort of thing. So. I think maternal complications have changed significantly. I've seen it in the 30 years I've been doing this. I've been starting out as a fellow to where I'm at now. I think it's more maternal than it is fetal. Unfortunately, then moms, you know, mom, the incubator's not working well, then we're gonna see more fetal problems, of growth restriction and that sort of thing. Yeah, 